Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Dementia Chats. I'm Lori LeBay, and I facilitate this conversation with the true experts, those living with the disease. I'm the founder of Alzheimer's Speaks and a care partner for my mother who lived with dementia for 30 years, and I just think these conversations are so valuable. Today, we're going to have a really interesting conversation and one that I think is so important, not only for people living with dementia to understand this, but their families and their doctors. This is a, an absolutely critical pivot point that people need to look out for and understand. And that is how dementia impacts other medical conditions. And I think so often it's just poo-pooed and people separate them, but they, they work together in concert and not always well. So we're first going to start out by having everybody introduce themselves, and then we'll get on to the conversation. Mark, do you want to go first? Sure. Thanks, Lori. Um, Mark Timmons. I'm currently living in Massachusetts, currently uh, diagnosed with early onset dementia. Great. Harry? My name's Harry Urban. I live in Pennsylvania. I just celebrated my 18th year anniversary of the diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Well, we're glad you're still with us and doing fine, Harry. So thank you. Um, Lori? I'm Lori Scher. Uh, I live in Alabama. And uh, I was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's and FTD. Thank you. True? Full legal name is Truthful Loving Kindness. Um, I have Lewy body and vascular symptoms, but my Diagnosis is a uh, mild cognitive impairment because the decline is so slow. Okay, thank you. Craig? Hi, my name's Craig Hanke. Um, from Wisconsin. Um, I was diagnosed in 2014 with Lewy body dementia and Parkinsonism symptoms. Um, since then, my diagnosis just this past year was changed to uh, mild cognitive impairment with Lewy body symptoms. Thank you. And Kate. Hi there. I'm Kate Lau. I was diagnosed with uh, BVFTD, which is behavior variant frontotemporal dementia in 2014. Prior to that, in 2012, I was diagnosed or misdiagnosed with Alzheimer's for two years. And I uh, was on a lot of medication for Alzheimer's. Uh, and uh, I, I was very ill because with FTD, there's no medication whatsoever. Okay. So. Lori, do you want to kick us off on this topic? Sure. Our, we were talking together about how our dementia impacts other things, how it impacts our other illnesses, or uh, even getting the flu or the cold. And I'll use an example. I had surgery on my shoulder twice, and they couldn't repair it all the way. I can only lift it this high. And when my shoulder hurts, when it's causing me pain, I get stressed, which impacts my dementia. The more I get stressed, the tighter the muscle gets. Therefore, the sore the, the shoulder gets um, and the worse my dementia gets. So it's, it becomes a bit of a, a circle. Um, our pain increases our stress, stress increases our dementia um, and it, fevers. When you have a fever, who fevers can really cause your dementia symptoms to to really act up, it causes a lot of confusion, a lot of disorientation when there's a fever. It's a lot of things that dementia leads into. Um, their dementia can is not just memory, it's not just confusion, but dementia can cause different parts of your body to begin to shut down, um, whether it's you can no longer speak, whether it's in, in one case, just recently, we lost someone living with dementia who had Lewy body and his body stopped producing nutrients. So he was eating, but his body didn't maintain any nutrients and therefore he basically starved to death. That was because of his dementia. 
Dementia impacts our balance, the way we walk or don't walk. Uh, frequently, dementia ends up uh, telling your head, tells your, your throat not to swallow and you choke. So there's many things that dementia can lead into. Okay, great. Thank you. Mark, how about you? How has your dementia impacted or other conditions, I should say, impacted your dementia? Yeah, Laurie, I think it's it's more the second. I think what I've noticed with me is, is um, you know, other illnesses that affect my dementia. Um, I'm on the tail end of uh, having been battling COVID for a few weeks. And um, during the time that that the COVID was at its worst, um, you know, I found, found all of my dementia symptoms, you know, the memory, the, the balance issues, the um, uh, confusion about time and place, they, they all seemed to be amplified while I was trying to work through COVID. Um, you know, I also been diagnosed with severe sleep apnea and epilepsy and um, particularly the sleep apnea. Um, you know, we know now that that sleep plays a big role in um, people living with dementia and um, I'm trying to get uh, my 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 the quality and the length of my sleep um, under control and improved um, because when when I don't then um, you know it makes for it makes for a difficult day of, you know the following day with my dementia symptoms um, you know one thing might not be quite on topic but but on my mind and, and worth noting is, you know, a lot of time, you know, in my case, I find that um, the doctors want to separate the, the various illnesses and not treat it as, as part of the whole part of the whole. Um, um, I've got a doctor that only wants to um, address the dementia symptoms and wanted a different neurologist to address the epilepsy symptoms when, when it's quite possible that um, the epilepsy symptoms have... Um, a place in the in the origins of of my dementia um, wouldn't be so bad if there was better communication among the doctors <laughs> among the various specialists and um, um, uh, but I know I'm going I'm going way off topic and and I am having a a, a difficult. Uh, time today, keeping keeping my keeping my my thought process on 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 target. So I'm going to leave it at that. Well, first of all, I want to say that was totally on target because doctors working together is critical, and you know specialties are great, but they need they do need to communicate because one triggers another one. I, I was. Uh, just going over and editing one of our other sessions. And I think, I think it was Kate that said one of her doctors took control and said, don't talk to any of the others until they talk to me first, because they are making changes that are affecting your dementia. And it's, it's almost like there's got to be one person at least overseeing that. And that is not done well in our medical system at all these days. And I, I appreciate the specialties, but there is overlap. And not for one second should they ever forget that. I want to welcome Karen Creaky with us today. Karen, we're talking about how dementia is impacted by other medical conditions that you have. 
And so I'll come to you last so you can kind of hear hear um, everything that is going on and get a little better feel for it than that. But I'm going to have you go ahead and introduce yourself right now, if you don't mind. Uh, Creaky, Karen Creekmore. Um, I got diagnosed 2014 initially with Alzheimer's and unspecified dementia then minor neurodegenerative, blah, 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 blah. And I'm from Corpus Christi, Texas. Wonderful. Thank you. Harry, I'm going to have you go next and um, talk about this topic of how other medical conditions can affect your dementia. I used the example in the, in the pre-show talk of how when my stress level goes up, uh, it affects my asthma. It affects my breathing. Hmm. And again, I end up having an asthma attack. Now, I don't have your, your uh, uh, everyday asthma attack. My asthma attack sends me to the hospital. Now, I thought, I thought I'd get a new hobby. So um, I thought, hey, I'm going to get one of those 3D printers because they are so neat to have. So I got a 3D printer and this box came. And I looked at the box and I thought to myself, well, that box looks nothing like the 3D printer I bought. So I opened up the box and it's not assembled. I got to put this stupid thing together. <laughs> now, I wanted to tell them that, hey, I've been living with dementia for 18 years. You know, you don't sell me something that I got to read instructions to put together. But anyway, it said it's only going to take you 40 minutes to two hours to put this together. So I said to my wife, Hazel, I said, hey, let's give it a shot. She said, okay. Well, let me tell you, the instructions were not written for somebody living with dementia. Now, my stress level, if there was an 11, it would be up at 11. So I got this stupid thing together. and. My wife Hazel says, we're done for the day. Okay, so we're done for the day. So I picked it up the next day after not sleeping in a minute all night, worried about this stupid printer. And I find out that there's so many other things you have to do, like, like the, the stuff one feed. Uh, I had to have special software. I had to level the bed. So anyway, to make a long story short, it took me another day. And I finally said, okay, I'm done. So I said, before I try this, I went out to my shop and I got the biggest ball peen hammer I had. I came back in. And I looked at it and I said, if you don't work, you out of here. I got a new hobby. So anyway, to make a long story short, it did, it did work. But my point is, um, in fact, I made this. Now, how cute is that? <laughs> it's too, my, my wife has arthritis and she has a hard time taking a bottle cap off. So you use that and you can take it off. But anyway, my point is that we have to learn how to handle these symptoms. We have to learn how to handle the stress of it. Like I could have freaked out with that, with that printer. You know, I could have ended up in a hospital with my, with my asthma, but over the years, I've learned steps on how to control 
myself and keep my anxiety level down. So Harry, can you give us an example of that other than walking around with a ball peen hammer? <laughs> yeah. How you keep your stress down? <laughs> <clears throat> well, well you, have, you have to know when to back off. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, like I can tell if, if my hands get sweaty, I'm in trouble. If I, you know, if I start wheezing, I'm in trouble. So you have to learn right away to back off. And then after you back off, um, I have to redirect my mind someplace else. Okay, I can't constantly think of my problems. I have to think of something pleasant. And that's how I, I start bringing down my anxiety levels. Okay, great. Those, those are good, good points for people to understand. Because I think a lot of times we do push... Um, or ignore the signs our body's giving us. Lori, you had your hand raised? Yeah, feeding off what Harry said. I think sometimes too, one of the concerns with dementia is that when we're having other things like an asthma attack, we forget what to do. We mm -hmm. forget how to respond. And so we don't maybe respond quick enough. We don't respond quick enough with an inhaler or we don't realize that we're having that symptom and therefore we become in more in more distress than we probably would have if it wasn't for the dementia. Good point. Good point. Harry, would you, would you agree with that? That there's sometimes you, you don't pick up on your signs? Absolutely. You, you have to learn the signs because if you don't, you're going to ignore them. Okay. You know, you're going to, you're going to push yourself. You're going to get angry. And, and things like that. So you have to learn, you have to learn your limits, you know, and not go, not go beyond those limits. Like with me with that printer, I could have said, well, another hour I'll have this thing done. But reality is no, because it took me another day. And, um, not only, not only does it affect my asthma, but it, it affects my heart, you know, things like that. And I could, I could feel a tightness in my chest. And the next thing I think to myself, I'm going to die. I'll be caught up a stupid printer. So you have to learn how to handle this, see what the symptoms are. It's so important to say. Uh, now, people just ignore that, and they say, oh, I can't do that. I've been living with this disease for 18 years. By rights, I should be dead. Statistics says I should be dead. But um, I've learned how to live a happy life. Now, you have to remember that my memory is shot. I mean, I can't remember nothing. But you know what? I've learned that that doesn't matter. You know, I focus on what I can still do. I mean, I can't handle money. I can't do that. I can't do most of the things normal people can do. But you know what? I still know how to put a smile on my face and be happy. And you put a smile on a lot of other people's faces too, Harry. <laughs> you got to remember that. Um, one thing I want to just mention here, because I think it was a really good point about sometimes you guys might miss the symptoms if someone is lucky enough to have a care partner. Harry, when you mentioned the sweaty hands, that's something I wouldn't have thought of, but how easy for a care partner when they see someone's distress without saying, you know, let me check this just to come up and hold your hands and say, tell me about this. And then they can see, you know, are your hands sweaty? You know, they can use that as a measurement tool. But again, those things have to be communicated for people to know to watch for those things too. Go ahead, Harry. So many people I talk to say that the spouse is getting aggressive. And um, I think I'm going to have to put them in some kind of facility. And the first thing I ask them is, why are they getting aggressive? Now, if the care partner can sense somebody getting aggressive or getting to that point of, high anxiety, 
they can bring them down and they don't have that problem. But that's one of the things that care partners have to learn. Yeah. And they have to be taught and it should be coming, in my opinion, out of the doctor's office initially that there is those types of controls and in ways to help. Um, Craig, I'm going to go to you next and then to True. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can't agree more with Lori, Mark, and Harry so far. Um, just the curious of putting something together, they give you instructions and then like you open it up into like seven different languages and you never find English. And when you do it with a dang small, you can't even read it with a magnifying glass. So they direct you to a website that'll help you put the scene together. Well, anybody knows, any of us know that trying to follow things like a website and instructions on a website doesn't work. It doesn't, it, it, you hear it, you see it, but it doesn't register as what you're actually supposed to do with it. And with what Mark was saying, um, the 27th of December last year now, I came down with uh, COVID. And as many of us also know, if you put a dementia patient in a different room, a different city, a different setting, it can be very distressing and very confusing. So now I'm in this water park with 10,000 other people. The noise is bouncing off and I had to put earplugs in and um, started feeling bad. So I went back to the condominium that we were staying in and uh, the fever started. And I felt like garbage so I went went to bed laying in bed some people with Louis body dementia or most people have hallucinations with Louis body um, now I had a high fever that was spiking at 103 104 um, now I'm hallucinating from the fever so you're asking yourself is this the dementia is this a fever what's going on here because it was a whole different kind of the of hallucination my, my hallucinations are always the same thing but this those four days that i had this when those symptoms were bad complete different set of hallucinations and i didn't know how to react to it i don't know if i should react to it it, it is very difficult to handle and right now i'm dealing with i went to the doctor last week for a medicare physical and i had some other problems up here and she diagnosed me with the ear, ear infection and sinus infection on this side. So like Mark was saying, your balance can be off uh, because your ear is all screwed up. Your equilibrium is off. So you're walking into walls. Um, my wife wanted me to stand on a step ladder and do some work. I was like, no, I'm not, <laughs> not even thinking about doing that. But just the doctor checked my my blood pressure and it was fairly high it was like 147 over i think 97 so she's concerned about that she's been concerned for a while um she wants me to exercise and lose weight which i'm not doing so well at but um i have to call her today because i checked my blood pressure last night and it was 165 over 117 now that's that's getting up there. Um, 180 is a heart attack feet based on what I read. So I'm calling her doctor today, but yeah, it's it just dealing with the fever, and I, I I wanted to take care of myself because we were up there with the grandkids and and uh, grand and kids in this big water park. Did I have fun? I would have had more fun staying in the condominium by myself, watching the fire in the fireplace there's just too many people too much noise um middle of covid and just water there's like several water parks there and they're all huge they take a football field size of land and you walk in and you're walking around the whole place trying to find an open table and sometimes it takes an hour but once you find one you dive in you take your stuff you Nothing is wiped down. We forgot to take our wipes along. So you're you're in, already in the middle of this, I call it a cesspool of germs. Um, 
And she was heck, I asked the sick. My son says, yeah, we worry about 10, out of 10,000 people, we had to worry about you. I say, well, I didn't ask for it, but I think it would have been a lot easier dealing with the COVID and this blood pressure thing without the dementia, because now, like Harry, my stress level's up. Am I gonna have a heart attack? What's gonna happen with this blood pressure thing now? Um, and it just, it just complicates other symptoms of other illnesses. Well, you know, I think that's an important factor too, because I don't think we always talk about what gets our blood pressure up. And stress gets your blood pressure up. And yet the doctors don't seem to say, take a couple of breaths, you know, or, or give you some ideas for meditation or whatever. But when your mind starts looping on stuff like that, it, and it happens to a lot of people, not just people with dementia, you know, there are going to be repercussions and a lot, and we're not told I don't think we're told enough to pay attention to what our mind is thinking about and how that affects our body. And so I think that that's a really, you know, good point. And even, you know, when you were mentioning about the going to the water park, you want to, you want to be with your family, you want to see your grandkids. And so you kind of said, okay, I'm going to push this stuff over to the side, or I'm going to try about worrying about COVID, but then you're in that environment and it's a lot of people and it's noisy and you, you know, you're in search for a safe spot. And then, oh my gosh, we forgot our way. I mean, all of that stuff, you know, circles in and as, as hard as you try, it's still playing in the back of your mind and it's still affecting the rest of your physiology in your body with that. So I, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. I thought it was good. Also, when you talked about the fever and the hallucinations and and, you know, I usually hallucinate this, but that's not what happened this time. And so then that threw you for a loop as well, because you you learn to adapt. But when things get thrown, uh, people need to understand or a little thing like an ear infection. People don't think that's a big deal because m- most people don't lose their balance with an ear infection. It's sore and it's uncomfortable and things. But but that's really important. And gait is one of those things that I, I think isn't talked about a whole lot with dementia and yet it's, it's affected an awful lot. So thank you for that. True. You want to go next? Basically all I can do is say, yeah, I agree. You want me to go through how those things affect me? I, I think that would be helpful because they affect everybody a little bit different and we all say it a little different. So people, you know, people are going to resonate with different voices in the way okay. it's done. For me, probably the biggest thing is that dementia creates stress. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people say, oh, no, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. But it's almost everything about dementia creates stress because you are losing every ability. You are losing every context. And so your brain is scrambling and saying, I knew that. Where is it? Um, and that increases the stress. Um, since I have fibromyalgia, increases my body pain. Then all the signals are busy carrying pain signals. So they can't carry the signal that says, lift up your arm. Remember to do this when you're lifting up your arm, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a biggie for me with fibromyalgia. With my dementia, I have tremors. My tremors are getting very bad. And that creates problems getting my medication into my mouth, creates problems. It creates, since I don't have hunger sensations, I have a tendency to put off eating and I have extreme hypoglycemia where I'll end up needing to call 911. Um, and so that's a complication with medical, other medical conditions. Oh, and with dementia, okay, you've got a condition that you've been able to handle in the past. You know the strategies, you know what to do, but with dementia, you forget. 
So those strategies are not put in place for those other conditions. And sometimes, again, you don't notice it. Just like for me, I don't notice, okay, I'm an unsatisfied, is that the word? There is something niggling, you know? Um, but I don't have any idea what it is. And I'll go, you know, several hours and then I'll see a glass of water on a counter somewhere. That's what it was. That's what it is that I'm needing. I'm needing a drink. But the connection is broken before. There's dementia falls and my osteoporosis. I've had osteoporosis for uh, more than 10 years. So those two have bad connections. Um, I might have already said this. The fibromyalgia pain produces the all signals busy, makes it so that cognitive um, signals don't go through. Well, thanks, Drew. I'm glad you mentioned that. Again, it, it gets into that whole pain level of throwing things off kilter and not being able to decipher. I, I think the tremors, um, what you brought up about the medication and, you know, the kind of non-interest in, in eating or drinking or being able to identify those things when you need them is important. The fall thing is something we hadn't really talked about, but again, gets into that whole balance thing and, and how, um, how that can throw things off. And, um, you know, most people have more than one health condition. And so these are things that they really need to, uh, need to know. Kate, I'm going to let you go next. Do you want to talk about how your other medical conditions impact your dementia? Yes. When I had my carotid surgery, the first thing they said was, so how was it, you know, with your dementia and everything? I said, you know what? The pain of my uh, stenosis with myelopathy on my neck had the nurses come in every two hours to give me pain medication. No, I couldn't think of anything, dementia or anything. I couldn't think of the sur surgery. Um, it's unrelated, yet it's related because two, three years ago, I had, I, had a, I had multiple strokes. So it's either go have your carotid done or you, you, you're a walking time bomb or have your carotid done there, at least the surgeons were there. So, you know, which one do you want? So that uh, at a time like that, when uh, all the big things are happening, I tend to forget about my dementia, I'm focused on this big thing, big thing. Like um, on my birthday last week, I was told that um, I have to go back for the biopsy of what I went through last year. Every organ, here we go again, um, because my potassium is not good anymore and um, my body is attacking itself, and this time it's very aggressive, and uh, it's not making the uh, the right proteins or whatever, and so it cannot fight anything at all. So now oncology is very busy looking at my blood. Of course, at this point we think I'm anemic because yesterday, my I thought I had to stress just like uh, Harry. We both always talk about this like. I couldn't breathe, you know, or is it anxiety? Uh, is it, I'm not getting oxygen because my red blood cells are all gone, literally. So you would think the doctor would say, well, you know, um, maybe because of your red blood cells, you're not getting oxygen. That's why you are breathing like that. So come down and see you. But uh I said, don't want to go to ER. Don't want to go to convenient care. They said, there's a thing at the trauma center where you went to, it's called past convenient care. That means it is between ER and COVID convenient care. I said, that I'll do. But then she called back. She said, she needs to see me within the hour. So I went there and uh, I was told that I've got something that 
Craig cannot pronounce and nobody can. <laughs> so I had to write it somewhere. Hopefully I, I, I wrote it. Wow, what a word it is. It is called hypogamma globulinemia. The anemia, I suppose, has something to do with anemia. So yesterday, when I was going through all this breathing stuff, I started to like want to fall. That never happened to me. I was dizzy. I was so dizzy. I was almost passing out. So that's when the nurse said, the doctor wants to see you. She didn't know I was dizzy until I went in. And I told her about it. And um, we, she says, well, I've got a ton of labs. I said, no, you don't. We did it last week. She said, oh, yeah, we did it last week. That concerns me that I've got to remind her, you know, nowadays about things that have been done. I said, my potassium is fine. We were sitting there and I was looking, 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 reading all the stuff. And then I said, everything is fine. She said, but I think you have an inflammation somewhere. And uh, I'm afraid it's your brain because I've got to go for a neuro um, ophthalmology or optometry thing because I've got a headache here that happens once in a while. And uh, it throbs and it's just one thing just here. And then yesterday after the, after the checkup, I find that my eye could just see up to here. And this is all blind. I could not see from there to here. So in so saying, I'm looking at the personal life and the emotional life ahead of me. And I was thinking, um, even with the dementia, people don't trust you with the children and you don't trust yourself with children too. So th there went my grandchildren. And then now with this, I didn't tell my children yet because I still want to enjoy my grandkids. So has it got something to do with my dementia? Yes, because now I'm getting like, I'm not worried about it. I'm getting more angry and faster. You know how FTD, we just, we can't behave ourselves because that's why mine is a BV kind, you know, behavior variant. I can't behave myself. I don't know, you know, am I angry right now or what? I just, I will just say something and uh, it, it comes out wrong, you know. And the worst thing is finding the words to say. Oh my gosh, I can't find the words. I can't find the words. So I just say, get out of here. I don't. You know, and and at first, when I first had FTD, I thought that it's the other person's fault, the other person's fault. Now I can calm down just a moment. It, it is you. It's not your fault. It's the disease itself. I want another me. I'm waiting for somebody to clone another <laughs> one of me. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing. You've got a lot going on. And those are really big things. Craig, go ahead, because I know you need to hop off. Just thinking maybe Harry could print the new you on his 3D printer. <laughs> <laughs> wow. A comment on Harry said before, too. I'm no longer able to have anything around me when I'm watching TV, television. Because my two things that are changing rapidly the last two months is my patience level is like nothing. And my temper is getting very bad. So I'm no longer allowed to have a remote, a glass of soda, nothing around me while I'm watching television because she's caught me twice going like this, getting ready to throw it at the TV because I was so worked up about it. Another good thing for people to know in terms of a technique to try to avoid those types of situations. So thank you. Creaky, how about you? Anything that you'd like to share about other conditions in your dementia and how it's affected? When you first started this, it was like, you know, other conditions. I'm like, I know I've got some conditions. What are they? I had no clue. And I, that's what I was messing around with. Is I have a buttload of them. Uh, and really the only ones, I mean, a lot of them are physical and stuff. But the ones that I think I have the most problem discerning are dementia or uh, PTSD or anxiety or, you know, those kind of behavioral issues that I've had before, you know, and so I'll, 
I tend to blame dementia, but then my mind races and says, is it dementia or is it just me being anxious? Or is it just this? Or is it just this? Uh, to where, again, with my progression, I get more convoluted. And so then my behavioral changes are impacted. So that's, that is, that's the big difference for me. I think for, for, for myself, trying to recognize that I live alone. So uh, I don't have someone to depend on to uh, help me uh, discern. So uh, I have to have, uh, True's really good about saying uh, strategies, you know, we all have to have uh, strategies to help compensate. I, I do, I have to keep it to me. Uh, is it dementia, is it my health? Um, and what I have to do, I have to stop that chatter and say, okay, we got these two, health. Let's, let's rule out anything that might be causing this health-wise. You know, so that, that makes my choices a little less. I don't know if I'm making sense or not. Um, and uh, oh, being able to retrace my steps. I recently um, got a speeding ticket. 30 years or whatever. Uh, but I was able to, unfortunately, I got the ticket, um, follow back on, was I? Was I in a hurry? And was I doing this? And was I doing this? Everything was perfect, except I wasn't paying attention to my speed. That's a huge one, you know. Uh, so these other things that I'm having, needing help with. I have help, but I need more help. I have a, um, my, my friend, my backup brain, Katie, who comes in and helps me with my financial stuff and uh, helps me get my cremation taken care of, all the, all the um, brain stuff that I'm not good at. Uh, she's great at that and also medications. That was a huge one for me. I still do it. I'm still independent, but she's got those eagle eyes watching me to make sure that I don't mess it up. And just real quickly, I don't, I, I never used to have to have alarms and lists and all of this, but these are my workarounds. These are the things that I need to remain independent. But even though I'm independent, I also need help. And I have to recognize that or I'm not safe. So that's kind of, kind of where I am. Does, does pain or having a fever throw you for a loop with your dementia? Um, I don't have fevers. I don't, I don't get sick. Um, I have a lot of pain, but I don't think it, I don't think it does. No. Okay. Did, did you have pain before your dementia? I mean, was that something that you had to learn to live with? Oh yeah. Knee replacement, shoulder replacements, gastric bypass, you know. Yeah. And I did the drugs, you know, I did, I did the drugs and stuff, but it was something that I have to live with is a chronic, chronic. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, one thing that we didn't talk about a whole heck of a lot, um, but it kind of gets into that doctors need to communicate was the effects of one medication for maybe one health condition and how that can affect mm -hmm. dementia. Um, if I can just see a raise of hands of, of people who have had difficulty with a prescription that's been ordered for them with their dementia, because I've heard that as, as being fairly typical too with that. Um, and again, I think you guys have, have pinpointed a lot of different things in terms of the overlap for people who are listening, you know, just sit back and think if you're living with dementia, your family member, or if you're a clinician or a doctor, how is what I'm prescribing for somebody going to affect their dementia? You know, stress seems to be the number one thing that everyone um, kind of pinpointed. So Lori, go ahead. Picking up on what Craig said, um, I watch only Hallmark anymore. You know, it always has a happy ending. I don't go to bed stressed, doesn't stress me out. I know what's going to happen if I don't get to watch it. I know what the ending is. So that's a positive thing. I don't have to think about it um, because watching the news or watching uh, 
the other day Roy was watching the Fast and Furious, I think it's called. I was like, you know, just the car chase and the, the violence. Um, I, I can't take it because then that does impact my stress and my anxiety, even though I know it's a stupid TV show. You know, it's a stupid movie. Um, my head doesn't always make the translation and it just makes me stressed out. So I'm like, Hallmark's all I ever watch. But I, I found that I have to focus on one thing if I'm going to accomplish it. Only one thing. And I'll sometimes go in my office and shut the door and just say, if anybody calls, no. You know, I just, if I, if I try to think on multiple things, it's definitely going to increase my stress level and I'm going to end up accomplishing nothing. Um, but also we were talking about doctors. It's not just your neurologist, your family doctor. It's things like eye doctors. Uh, since my dementia, I have a real issue with lights. Even when I'm taking a shower, the light reflecting off the water can cause me to become disoriented. And yet I go to the eye doctor and he wants me to see a specialist because I can't handle the light in my eye. And I'm like, no, it's my dementia. It's, it's all light. Oh no, you need to see a specialist. Your eyes are too sensitive to light. And trying to explain, I deal with this all the time. It's not something with my eyes, it's with, with my dementia. They don't understand. They don't understand that your dementia impacts more than just memory. And then you're, you're trying to do the eye chart and suddenly you just can't remember what, what the letter is. It's like, wait, I know that letter. And I'll say, well, you can't see it. Yes, I can. I can. I can. I just am having a brain fart and I can't tell you what it is, but I know what it is. It, it, it impacts so many areas of what we just do in life in general. I feel like sometimes I'm constantly explaining to people it's the dementia. It's the dementia. And they, they just, they don't, they don't get it. Yeah. I, I'm glad you brought that up about the eye doctor. Cause I remember um, my mom couldn't do the, the letters anymore. So then they gave her the kid chart with the cow and the horse and the pig and, and things. And, and again, for whatever reason, they were thinking too, that um, initially that she couldn't see it. And she was saying the same thing. And so this doctor at least switched it to something else to see if pictures you know, would be recognizable because they kind of have a one way, my way or the highway type thing of, of how you're going to identify stuff. Um, same with, you know, hearing, you know, trying to um, communicate, I would imagine would be difficult. Of, did you hear that sound? Was it high pitch, low pitch, you know, those types of things um, or the dentist? Um, true. When I went to the eye doctor, they had um, the, the, I guess you would call it intake. Um, there was no, no room for guy to be in the room with me. And I said, oh, well, I've got dementia, so it, it's going to be a problem. And she says, well, just sit down. And I, I said, okay. She says, uh, how old are you? And I said, I've got dementia. I don't know how old I am. And she says, how old are you? And I said, well, I was born in 1957. If you can do the subtraction, because I can't. She says, how old are you? I was getting a little bit pissed off, actually. <laughs> and I said, I have dementia. I cannot do the subtraction. She says, how old are you? And I said, just a minute. And I went out to the waiting room. And I asked Guy. She went to the next question, which I don't remember what it was, but I couldn't answer it. And I ended up going out to the waiting room again and asking Guy. And 
it, that happened three times. And I was so disgusted that they would not provide adaptive situ situation or either that or she didn't know what, a de what dementia was. And I think that happens more often than we like to admit or that um, clinics and businesses are, are assessing it's even happening. How awful to make you feel. I mean, it just amplifies that you don't know instead of making you feel comfortable and supported through that. So yeah, lots of changes, lots of um, good information that you guys have given us today. Anybody else want to add anything else before we wrap up? Mark? Yeah, um, it was just, just popped into my head. Um, I've been living in this town in Massachusetts for a little over a year. And I don't know, it was a couple of months after I moved in. Um, I got this. I don't know if it was a text or an email, but basically it was an invitation to go online to the town's website, town government website. Um, and this is creaky. This, this, what you were talking about, because I live alone too. So, so this is what prompt, this is what got this into my head. I don't know if other communities do this and if they don't, they ought to start. I can. I went in, and it took a while to fill out all the online pa pages. Um, you know, it was a good 15 minutes of questions that I was answering online. But basically, the the end result is, if I ever have to call 911, the dispatch already knows everything. They know I have dementia. They know my bedroom is in the last is at the end of the hallway in my apartment. They know that I don't have any any animals on the premises. Um, you know, they know I'm not that I can't drive. They ask questions, you know, in the event of an evacuation order, you know, are you able to get, you know, 50 miles away from from your location? No. You know, they they know everything I need to know to respond to to an emergency if I called 911. And I think that's so important because, you know, so many times if, a, you know, in a 911 situation or just in the street, you know, a, a stranger comes, ac comes across and, and they don't know that you, you have this, you know, these conditions, they're not going to um, react appropriately in a lot of cases. And, and I think what, what my town has implemented is just a, a really good program to have that, that I think other communities should have as well. That's fantastic. I had not heard of that. I would love to connect um, afterwards with you on that because I would, I would love to have them on the radio show to talk about that. I, I know that you can call into 911 and you can tell them that a person with dementia is, you know, living in that household, you know, what their nicknames are, what, you know, what direction they typically walk to, if it's right or left, you know, um, which hand, uh, and they say, whatever is your dominant hand, that's the way you, you normally will, will head off, but nothing in terms of the detail that you've given. And I would, I would really love to talk with them more on that. So if we can maybe connect afterwards, um, sure. that's, that's wonderful, wonderful to know. Anybody else have anything else to add? Yes. Uh -huh. I say, I've, got, I've got so much to do. You know, <laughs> I've got to go home and do so much things. And I find out next time when I come in my house, I've done the same thing that I've been doing for two months. So all the other things were not done. I keep on going, you know, to the one thing. And then later I get very angry because I went like, why couldn't I see all the other things and do them? And so I don't, I don't, I don't go, I don't go ahead. I, I, I'm just stagnated. You know what I mean? So when I look at my house, I went like, oh, I wanted to do that. Yeah, I'll do that later. Let me get this again. Here we go again. Paper clips. Every, everything has to be in their place. <laughs> and then kitchen, peppermint spray. So to, to make sure that I don't have insects, rodents and all that. 
I went like, okay, now I can go. So I called my daughter to pick me up. She says, so you got a lot done, mom? I said, yep. But it's the same thing. I'll come back to the same thing. What is wrong with me? <laughs> well, I don't think there's anything wrong. Those are probably the things you feel most comfortable doing, you know, and they were high priority for you. And, yes. you know, when you, when you can't discern if you've done those before or not, you know, that's always kind of at the top of top of your list. So I think that, um, I think that happens to a lot of people in terms of their to-do lists. Lori, Lori Sher was saying that, uh, what were you saying? If you go to your room, then you feel better, right? I cannot go to certain rooms. It just, if there's things that's not in place, then I cannot, you know, I cannot be at peace. Uh, there was a time when I didn't know how to read. I was like shocked. I, I looked at a book and I didn't know how to read. You guys have heard about the story at the library. And uh, now I've got an, an escape. I'm doing Kindle. My goodness, I've read so much that I've already hit the streak for the last, for next month, I think. And I, I get on free books, you know. And if anybody has time to find a book to read, it is a real story written by uh, uh, the New York Post, one of the re reporters about her story. It's almost like what we're going through, her feelings. And she went through it for only seven months and suddenly she got well. This is an awesome, awesome book. It's called Brain on Fire. I think it's now on Netflix. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. I don't see, I don't watch Netflix or anything. I I because I'm on my reading streak here. Okay, I must win. <laughs> so yeah, it's written by Sarah uh, McCallan, I think. Yeah, it's a real story. She's back to her work now. Yeah, yeah, it's called Brain on Fire. Remember that. I haven't watched it yet, Kate, but it's in my list of movies oh, yeah? to watch. Yep. Read it. I read everything. I don't watch much movies. I read and. Uh, that's my, that's my escape right now. Kate, when you're fatigued, what do you do? I went like, I just go to bed. Mm -hmm. What else can I do? Like I, can't, I can hardly hold, uh, unless I get toothpicks and prop up my eyelids, you know, I just go to sleep, you know what I mean? And then I also have a new um, uh, symptom. I wake up and I start shivering. Okay, well, I think we'll go ahead and, and wrap up here. Um, I want to thank you guys so much for this information. To our listeners, I hope you got a lot out of this. I know I learned new things. I love having these conversations. I always learn, learn new stuff from you guys. So thank you so much. Please like, click, and share. We'll talk soon. Bye now.